I'm just going to read from a couple of verses in the book of Colossians. And uh, as Paul <coughs> was exhorting the church there and looking to establish them, a church he hadn't been to physically, but he wanted to draw their attention because just like them and just like us, often there, we, we want to, we, we have lots of questions. We want this question. We think, okay, I need to know this and I need to know that. And, and, and sometimes we're like, well, I'll run after this. I'll run after that. And I need to change all this. And, and, and sometimes we get caught up in lots of stuff when there's one thing, yeah. one thing. And, and this is where I just want to bring our attention back to, to this, this one thing. And so Paul, as he's, as he's teaching and, and writing to this church in Colossae, chapter 1, I'm going to read some verses from chapter 1, and then jump over to chapter 2 and just read a few, and we're going to go from there. And we're going to, I'm going to, going to read from, let's see, um, let's pull it from verse 24 of Colossians chapter 1. And we'll read down through verse 29. And then we'll pick up some verses in chapter 2. Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He's in prison. and So he fill up in my flesh what is lacking the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. He's not talking about going to the cross or paying for sin. He's saying it's costing me to preach the gospel. It's costing me. He physically, he got beat up. He got all sorts of stuff happened to him. He's, he's got scars on his body because he just wouldn't shut up about Jesus. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. God gave him a responsibility and a stewardship, which was given to me for you. It wasn't for him to just to give him a platform or something to do. It was given on behalf of others that he would minister to, to fulfill the word of God. So he's actually fulfilling that which God had spoken in the prophets that the gospel would not only go to the Jews, but would go to the nations. He was fulfilling that word that had been prophesied. Peter was a, uh, the apostle to the Jews or to the circumcised. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles or to the uncircumcised, the nations. He said, this mystery, which was, has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, the nations, which is what? Christ, where? In you, the hope of glory. He said, this is what, I, this is what I'm on about. Christ, where? In you. Not in Jerusalem, not just in the pages of the Bible, but where? In you. I just need to pause for a second. I'm just going to kind of digress for a moment. Uh, sometimes we have this concept, and it was really kind of an epiphany to me this week, where um, there's a concept in many nationalities and many kinds of backgrounds called where, where people refer to the pastor as the man of God. How many of you guys have heard that? Yeah. Okay. And so if I got to get help, I got to go to the man of God. Well, whoever just said no, in many nations, that's absolutely what they believe. Yeah. So if I need someone to pray for me, I need to go to the man of God. Why? Because they're the ones that are interceding. They're the ones that have the place with God. They're the ones that are walking in an obedient space. So if I need help, I got to go to the man of God. Are there such things as men of God? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Sometimes you need help in your situation. There's other people around you you can go to for aid. Is that not true? There's, this is called the priesthood of all believers where I can go to God on your behalf. You can go to God on my behalf. But there are those that God has anointed and equipped. But, but God's design is that you become the man and woman of God. Amen. That you do it. That you do it. You're not just waiting on someone else. Uh, Naomi, I think, was praying it. That, that you're not just waiting for someone else to do it on your behalf. So I can get on living my life the way I want. And then when I have a problem, I go to the man or woman of God. That's not God's design. But that it's Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. So you all become men and women of, not just for each other, but for the nations, for the world. This is making sense. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, him we preach. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom 
that we may present every man what? Perfect in Christ. This isn't a gender issue. This isn't talking about just men. This is about humanity. This is about those who belong to Jesus. He said that we may present you perfect in Christ. Do you think it's possible to be presented perfect in Christ? Um, Before heaven? That word perfect there means mature. I don't have to wait to heaven to become mature. You can grow up in Christ here and now. You can grow up in Christ while you're in the world because that's really what needs to be so that we become the full stature of Christ so that we're demonstrating Christ wherever we go. That the manifestation of Christ in me, the hope of glory, glory is really seen through your life. I don't have to wait till heaven. Now, is there an aspect that I have to wait for the redemption of my body? Absolutely. There's going to come a point Jesus is going to come back and my body will be raised from the dead if I'm dead. And if I'm alive, it'll be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. And the redemption of your body will take place. But we're being saved, body, soul, and spirit. We were born again of the spirit. Our soul is being, being renewed. Our minds are being renewed. We're walking in teachability and repentance and we're growing up in Christ. We're doing what his works are by the power of his spirit. And then in that day, our bodies will be raised from the dead and there'll be the redemption of our bodies. So we have a hope that's eternal in the heavens. But you can be presented perfect in Christ, mature. You've got little children. We love them. Run around. Crumbs everywhere. I don't know. But they, 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 they run around. And, and they can grow up in the presence of God, which is wonderful. But the main person that a child is concerned about is whom? Me, myself, and I. And when you don't feed me, myself, and I, what happens? Literally, all hell breaks loose. The flesh is, 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 is empowered by hell. You can't walk in the flesh and, and, effect, and expect to fulfill that which is in the spirit. <laughs> and so children, they, they, this is what they are. And they have to be trained not to function that way, yeah? Can I say to you, the idea that's in the Greek mindset that much of our education system addresses, saying leave a child alone, let them develop the way they want, and they'll be good. That is an absolute lie. The Bible says leave a child to itself and it'll destroy itself. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. If you let them just do whatever they want, just get them, let them get on with it. I'm telling you, the devil has a plan for their life too. And so do the teachers. I remember a young lady who was studying at Cardiff University when she started her nursing degree. Her lecturer stood up. He said, listen, he said, I know you're here to study uh, nursing. He said, but I'm a Buddhist and my main goal is to make all of you little Buddhists. So if you think teachers are neutral, you're mistaken. You need to know who's educating your kids. Sorry, this is just a side note. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, every person perfect in Christ. Paul says, to this end, I also labor striving according to the working which works in me mightily. Let's jump over to chapter two. Just read a couple of verses here. Verse six, let's pick up the reading from verse six. So the goal is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord. So what? Walk in him. Rooted and built up in him. Established in the faith. That as you have been taught, abounding in it with what? Thanksgiving. Now he gives a warning. Beware. Beware. If you do a study on beware and you look all the places where God gives warnings, do you think if God warns you about something, you should take it seriously? See, some of you are real quiet there. See, some of you take a lazy attitude towards the warnings and you think it just won't affect me. You'll get yourself in trouble. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you'll get yourself in trouble. Can Christians get deceived? See, there's some Christians who think it's okay to smoke dope. I I can walk in the spirit and smoke weed. You are mistaken. You are deceived and you are in bondage. 
say, well, I, I can worship Jesus and other gods as well. You are deceived. You are in bondage. You can't worship Jesus and Mary. You cannot worship Jesus. If you worship Mary, you are an idolater and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being straight. I'm being really serious. This is because there are people who come in sometimes to churches and they come in, they got their own ideas. And, 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 and they go and they listen to the preaching and like, well, I don't agree. I don't agree. But they stay there. Why? Yep. That's odd to me. Either you come with a heart of repentance to come into line with the teaching of scripture or you have another agenda. The Bible says that there are those who try to come in some other way. They're thieves and robbers. They come in with an agenda. They come in. Jude warned against. He said, there's people who come in unawares. They want to turn the grace of God into freedom just to do whatever you want. He said, that's a lie. Beware of that. If someone's telling you, you can live any way you want because you're under grace, they're lying to you. Don't be deceived. I'm going to sidetrack. We'll get back to this thing in a second, this warning. Put up on the screen for me, would you? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm just going to reemphasize this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, begin, we're going to read from verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Okay, what does he say? Do you not know that the what? Will what? Not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not. They will not. You say, well, I believe it. I don't, I don't care. So I, I believe it different. I, I don't care. Because he goes on to say, do not be, why? Because you could be what? Deceived. You can think that people who are unrighteous can still get into glory. Oh, that, that hit something there. there. There's some of you possibly here even this morning who think I can live anywhere. I can have one foot in the, in the kingdom and one in, in, in my carnal sinful stuff. And I can still have it all. You are absolutely deceived. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You need to repent and you need to give yourself fully to Jesus. There's no such thing as half Christian and half something else, which half goes to heaven. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is serious and no one else can make you do it. The Holy Spirit won't make you do it. See, the Holy Spirit comes to work in you. We submit to him and we cooperate with him. Demons and other spirits, they come to force you. That's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God invites you in. You come in, you submit yourself to the Lord. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And then we co-partner with him in the kingdom. So that's where you're stepping in faith with him. That, That is not the spirit of God. Even when he convicts you, he'll point you to Jesus. Why? Because the solution is paid for in Christ. The devil will condemn you. Say, there's no hope for you. You're just outside of it. This is, you're beyond help. And so it says in this, and it gets specific about the kinds of sins he's talking about. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor what? drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit what? This is what God's word says. You can't say that. Well, one, I just did. And I'm quoting what God has said. You can't function in a lifestyle like that and still belong to Jesus. Jesus is walking down a certain road. You want to go on a different road? You won't end up in the same destination. And this is simple, but I'm just saying, this is the truth. But he also goes on to say, and such were some of you. When you came to faith, you were delivered out from having to live that way. You were delivered out, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, it's just, just isolated. No, it's not isolated teaching here. Go to Galatians 5. We're going to pick up the reading with verse 19. The 
This is called cross-referencing. Okay? Where you look at a passage here, and you're like, that says something, and then you go over here, and it says very similar things, and you begin to compare them. It's called cross-referencing for those of you who are studying your Bible. Verse 19, for now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. You know that word sorcery there? I know you know this. I've said it many times. That word in the Greek, it's pharmakeion. It's the same word we get our word pharmaceutical from or drugs. You cannot smoke weed and still inherit the kingdom. If you're a follower of Jesus, you leave that stuff behind. Don't be deceived. Those who say, yeah, I've I've been baptized or I was dedicated or I went to this or that or did those things. So I I can do whatever I want now. They're liars. They're liars. And if you listen to them and you go their direction, you too will perish. Be be, please. I'm pleading with you. If you're online today and, and you're, you're pretending to be this or you're pretending to be, listen, you need to repent. You need to turn yourself over to Jesus and let him save you out of all the junk. Sorceries, hatred, contentions, hatred. Well, you don't know what they did to me. That's why I hate them. No, let it go. Let it go. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. You got a problem with your temper? Ooh, that hit something. If you think it's okay for you to lose your temper, you are mistaken. The work of the Spirit is different. It's not okay. It's sin. Well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I need a piece of your mind. I need a piece of mind of Jesus. So stop acting, acting out of your own resources and act out of his. Wow. There's freedom. Those who function, the the wrath, um, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Heresies, the root word for heresies is the word choice. I'll choose what I want to believe. You'll perish. God says it, and I believe it. That settles it. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. How about one more? I just want to kind of bend the nail over and kind of hammer it in on the other side. Ephesians chapter 5 as well. I'll start reading with verse two. It says, walk in and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us as an atoning, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Reading Ephesians chapter five, verse four, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who's an idolater has what? Any inheritance in the kingdom of God, uh, kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you. See, some of you might have family members where they say they belong to Jesus, they say they love Jesus, and yet you know they're walking contrary to Jesus. Don't be deceived by their lifestyle. Because you can look at me and think, well, they seem to be blessed. Well, actually, God can just say, fine, go. The devil's not going to go after somebody and, and womp on somebody who's fallen in his dark steps. He wants to make them look as good as possible. <laughs> Don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be, what? Partakers with them. You think that's clear? Some of you I know right now, you're feeling the conviction of it. Can I tell you? Just repent. What does that mean? Turn yourself over to Jesus. Turn your face fully to him and let him set you free. He's the Savior. Salvation is from Jesus. 
He's the only one that saves. He's the only one that can save. Everything you need is found in him. Can I say that again? Everything you need is found in Jesus. Everything you need is found in Jesus. Shut that up. Let's go back to that Colossians passage and look at that warning that's there. Verse six, it says, as you, as you therefore, in chapter two of Colossians, um, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so what? So how did you receive him? Let's start there. How did you receive Christ? I prayed a prayer. How'd you receive Christ? Everyone's really quiet. So either you don't know, okay, you're born of the spirit. That's true. That was God's work. How did you, what did you do? So by, by faith through grace. So can I say to you, everything that's in Christ is always through the grace of God, God's enabling power, God's help, God's attitude towards you. He freely gives. So that's God's grace. And then the other part is always through faith. It's your job to believe God. It's your job to believe God. Whose job is it? Your job to believe God. And so everything that we have is all in Christ. It's given to us. He paid for everything. He paid for it. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ. Everything that you stand in need of is in Christ. He is the fullness of God. In him, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. He is, he's the beginning of all wisdom. He's the end of all wisdom. He is, he is the one we look away unto Jesus, who's the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. Everything is found where? In Jesus. So, yeah, but I want the Holy Spirit. Who do you think baptizes in the Holy Spirit? Jesus promised in John 14 that I'm going to, I'll send another helper for you. He's going to be just like me. That word another means the same, but different. I know it's odd, but he's just like Jesus. He'll fill you. He's, Jesus is right now on the throne. He's reigning and the Holy Spirit comes to reign where? In you. He comes to produce the reality of Christ in you. You cannot continue to grow on with Christ without the work of the Spirit of God in your life. Amen. You can't. You have to continue on with him. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving, beware lest anyone, what? cheat you through philosophy or empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Beware. The word there for cheat means to take you and make you um, a captive and plunder and take everything you've got. When people go to war, at least before, I don't know how they do it now. But when you go into a city and they would take the city and they became the ones who conquered the city, everything in the city became the belonging of those who conquered it. So if you had like savings under your bed and you had this big thing of gold, you've been saving up for this and that, the conqueror comes in and they'll go under your bed and take everything you've got. So Paul's warning the church in Colossians because there were other ideas coming in. There were other things that I need Jesus plus or Jesus isn't enough. Or I prayed the prayer and now I just can go on with my life the way I'm doing it. I'll give my attention to everything else but Jesus and still expect the fruit of Jesus in my life. Don't be deceived. Yeah. See, the warning Jesus gave in the parable of the sower, there was only one out of the four that made it. That's 25%. Those aren't my words, that's Jesus. He said that gospel goes out, some it lands on hard spaces, and they're like, not, not believing that one. Behind the scenes, they're stealing it. They're the ones that they're shallow. As soon as it gets difficult, they're not going on any further. But then there's those who get bought off. 
the promise of riches, the promise of, I don't know, education, the promise of other things. I don't know what your other things are. Busyness of life. It says it'll choke it out so it does not bear fruit. Some of you young men, you've come into a faith in Christ and you've begun the race. You're not yet mature. You say, well, you don't understand, man. It's amazing because I can see it all now. I get it now. You've not walked in it yet. So you have to continue in the things that you've learned. You have to press into the things. It's like a child. The little kids, all they think about is themselves. You have to get out of that stage. Because you can come to church, bless me, bless me, bless me. And the only thing you're looking like, who's going to pray for me? Who's going to prophesy over me? Who's going to help me? And the only person you're thinking about is who? You. you got to grow up out of that. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Think, well, I don't know. I want to be blessed. Oh, yeah, so do I. But do you know that those who water are also themselves watered? Oh. See, it's like unto God when you give, because what does he need? He's the only independent being there is. He doesn't need air to breathe. He doesn't need food to eat. He doesn't need nothing. And he's the only independent being there is. So when he gives, that's his nature. He gives and gives and gives and gives. And every blessing he gives and gives graciously, graciously. Giving, 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 giving. You want to grow up and be like him? Everyone went quieter. I'm not after your money. If that's your God, you go worship there. I'm going to worship Jesus. You hear me? If you're, if you're worried I'm coming after your money, then you, it's going to show what's in your heart, not mine. I don't want your money. I don't care. I want to see the fruit in your life. I'm going to see you become a generous person who's able to give out of the abundance of God's resources so you can see the kingdom advance. But some of you, you're, you've, you've started off and now you're doing a bit of persecution. You got opposition, fine. But you're like, oh, I'm going to take it and I'm going to keep going. Fantastic. In the process of that, it's going to purify your motives. It's going to reveal that the faith that you have is actually from God. It's going to bring forth your faith like gold, where gold, when it's uh, refined by fire, even if you fire it up too much, gold will perish, but your faith will not. And it'll come forth pure. Now, you can have 12 karat gold or 9 karat gold or whatever it is, and then you got 14 karat gold, and what's the next one up? Uh, Some of you know what that looks like. Yep, uh (laughs) uh-huh. And you got that 20, now, the, now you, you, the gold is still, the nine carat is still gold, isn't it? Yeah. Why is it less valuable than the 24 carat? It's weaker. it's weaker. Why is it weaker? Because of mixture. Oh. Mixture. Yeah. Oh, that's going to hit home, Lord, help us. When you add things to it, that's not gold. It becomes not only weaker, but less valuable. Yeah. And what does God want to do? He wants to put that thing in the fire. Why? Because he wants 24 karat gold. He wants it in your life. He wants to be able to see his reflection in you and to build it up. And so some of you are like, man, I'm going for it. Tim's going for it. I I got opposition. No problem, man. I'm going to go for it. The problem comes is this. Is the enemy can't get you front front ways. Any ever seen ever the Jurassic Park movies? I know I'm dating myself now, but I remember I was watching it, this one movie, and they were, they were describing to me velociraptors. You ever heard of velociraptors? They were like, and, and they said, the one will look at you in the face, and while you're focused on this one to defend yourself against this one, one blindsides you from over here. Yeah. The enemy's like that. So he goes like this. You're facing opposition. You're like, yep, I'm ready for you. Come on now. I'm going to fight this fight. And, the, and it gets you from the side going, come on, man. And go to work for so-and-so, man, that gets you some money. Don't worry about worship. God, God loves you anyway. Man, come on. You know what? Man, you can't. You, know, you got to live. And if he can get you snuck on that one, he'll choke out the work that God's doing. Don't let him in. Amen. Some of you kind of middle-aged guys. You like your family, you got it established, you want to get the American dream even though you're not in America. 
Don't get bought off in the kingdom of God. Don't go borrowing money from unbelievers that will bring you into bondage. You need to be careful because the rich will do this with you. And you're like, oh, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I'm going for it. And while you're doing that, the enemy is going to come in and plunder everything you've got. So be careful, please. Don't get bought off by sport. Don't get bought off by money. Don't get off by girls or guys. Don't don't let him come in and, and rip you off from what he has. Don't even let pleasure be your main focus. So I'm just here to party. You can party all the way to hell. And there ain't no party in hell. Am I speaking clear enough? I just want to lay it out for you because this is what happens. I know it by experience. I know, I understand how it happens. I got back from Bible college and I studied, God did such a deep work. And then I went to work for this one business. It was driving a forklift at night. And I started the job and they accidentally paid me a dollar an hour more than what they were supposed to. And I got my paycheck. I said, oh, this isn't right. I didn't just say, well, it's your fault. I'm going to put my pocket. I went to my boss. I said, I'm sorry. He said, you're paying me too much. He said, for real? I said, I follow Jesus. I can't steal from you. He said, you keep it. It's like, okay, cool. And then I watched every year I was getting a dollar an hour raise. I was the only guy that carried the keys to the building, $6 million worth of merchandise. I was the only non-management person who carried the keys to the place. They could trust me. And then as, as they kept increasing, I'm like, Lord, I feel like I'm getting bought off here. Because the calling in my life is different. I'm not against driving forklift. That's what God's got you doing. And he's reaching the people there. And I was reaching people while I was doing the forklift driving. That's fine. But there was a different call on my life. And, and you can do good things without doing God things. That's the mixture. That's where the problem comes in. And it's like, well, and so and finally, it was just like, Lord. And then the call came and I was making good money, good money. I was on my way to management and tell you, they had a whole scheme of stuff that would a fantastic business, huge global business. And it's like, but I'm going to lay all of this down. I'm going back to the mission field. I'll live by faith. I will trust God for my provision. I'm not looking to man to do it. I'm looking to God to do it. And that's the fundamental of following Jesus. Someone who says, I don't want to live by faith. You're not following Jesus. Then you're trusting in your own resources because the just shall live by faith. So I left it all. Gave my car away. Everything I had away is like twice the times I'd done that. Twice, three times. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Because you don't want to get bought off. Don't get bought off. Don't get plundered. See, the world says you have to have it like this. The world says it has to look like this. Don't get, don't get deceived. Oh, we doing okay? Bless you, saints. Salvation is only in Jesus. You not only believed in him, but you continue in the things that you have learned. You continue in Christ. Unless you believed in vain, then you just need to get saved for real. See, some people say a prayer and they think, all right, I, I prayed the prayer, and, but nothing's changing in my life. That means you're probably not saved. Does that make sense? Yeah. See, well, I got baptized. Yep. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, should you? Absolutely. If you believe, believe and be baptized. Absolutely. But baptism doesn't save you like that. Yeah. Only faith in the Lord Jesus. Jesus, you get baptized by the Spirit into Christ. Yeah. Come 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he puts you in Christ. Now that's where the change begins. Without the change, there's been no change. change. 
The transformation of your life is the evidence of salvation. It's not where I pray the prayer, I go to church, I try to do good things. That's that We're talking internally because a good tree bears what? Good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. It's normal. A tree always bears fruit, doesn't it? it tell you what kind of tree it is by the fruit that it bears. So salvation is in him. Can I say to you, victory is in him. Victory is in him. How many of you guys say, I believe Jesus, and I know I belong to him, and and I'm trying to walk, but I'm struggling with stuff. I won't ask you to raise your hand. Sometimes we struggle with stuff. The struggle, 99% of the time, is internal. There are circumstances, there are things, but you're not under those. You're seated with Christ. But they're internal. But I want to tell you, the victory is in Jesus. In fact, go to Romans chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. I just want to show you something. Romans 6. And we're going to read verses 1, let's see, 1 to 5 real quick here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? Certainly not. No, God forbid. So there's an internal victory that he gives you in Christ, in Jesus. It's not just being forgiven. Okay, I've been forgiven for my sin. I'm not going to be condemned. That's not it. He saves you from your sins so that you can walk by the spirit and not walk according to your old nature, not walk in sin. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been what? United together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Go to verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So what happens is, is that when you came to faith, you were, un- you were brought to union with Christ. You, you were, Christ where? In you, the hope of glory. Does Jesus struggle with sin? No. Do you think he has the power to make you overcome? Yes. You can quit smoking dope. Hallelujah. Yes. You don't need to walk in adultery or fornication or pornography. You don't have to walk in an attitude of hatred or anger and resentment and gossip and partying and drunkenness and idolatry. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The victory is in Jesus. So in other words, you began with Jesus and you continue to walk in, in Jesus. Intimacies in Jesus. The victories in Jesus, the, the, the glories of what you need, the communion is in Jesus. In John 15, Jesus speaks of, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branch. He said, if you abide in my word, and he said, you abide in me, let my words abide in you, and then you'll ask what you desire and it'll be done for you. So you've got this relational communication. He's talking to you, you're talking to him. Imagine having a relationship where people didn't talk to each other. Some of you, I'm describing your home situation with your wife. Repent. Don't ignore your spouse, do you? Talk to him. Some guys, we need to talk a bit more. Need to listen maybe a bit more. Maybe we talk too much. Remember when Nathaniel was young, little tyke, he'd ask me questions. I remember one time he'd go, so he was asking me a question I was trying to answer, and he just wouldn't shut up. I said, Nathaniel, I said, you can't talk and listen at the same time. And then I heard the Lord speak to me. I said, wait. It's like, ooh. We don't just pray and go. We pray and listen. God's Spirit, he wants to talk to you. Jesus wants to share what's on his heart. When you grow up and you stop being like a, a little child, you start growing up. You've got to grow past the teenage years in the spirit. Teenagers know everything, and they carry no responsibility. 
Sorry, teenagers, if you're here. <laughs> See, what happens is you want your freedom, but you want mom and dad to pay for everything. Yeah? So, so I'm, okay, so I'm not picking on you. I'm not, I'm, but I'm just saying, this is a mindset. And this is where you need help. Now, in Christ, you don't have to function like the world functions. You can function in the spirit and God can help you where you learn the responsibility, how to carry it while they're helping you and providing for you. So in it, because you don't own the car yet, you might get to use it. You don't own the house, but you do get to to maybe fix food. Sometimes you get to do some things for yourself, but you're learning how to carry the responsibility because eventually you have to step out and you have to make all the decisions for yourself. You have to take care of all the business for yourself. You have to take responsibility. And in the same way, even in ministry, see, some people want to, uh, people say, oh, can, pastor, can I preach? I heard about a, someone told me last night that there was this one guy that was going around and he was saying to pastors, I'll pay you if I can preach in your pulpit. I thought, what the freak? If you say that to me, I'll rebuke you. How dare you? That pulpit's not for sale. And you say, well, I'll pay my own way and you don't have to pay. That pulpit's not for sale. But some people want it because they want the platform because it's all about and, and some people, then others, they like, they love giving advice without taking responsibility for what they're speaking to you. Yeah. Say, well, you know, what, what should I do? Well, I'll tell you what to do, blah, 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 blah. And they walk away and it doesn't matter to them whether would you do what they advise if it fails or succeeds. Because they know all the answers, isn't it? And you say to them, hey, how about this? Yeah, I know. Well, how about, yeah, I know. Actually, you don't know, because if you knew, you'd walk in it and learning how to grow up. When Jesus became, when he was baptized and the father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, he basically used the phrase in regards to Jesus's maturity. He used it and now it's like, here's the family name, <laughs> here's the car keys, here's the bank account, get on with it. I trust you with everything I have. Do you know that you can be in a place where in maturity, you can function in the fullness of what he's given to you. You're responsible. You've matured. I wish that could happen overnight. It doesn't. It's a process. You have to grow up in him. In the process, you're laying down your rights. You're laying down your life. You're not doing what I want. I'm not the focus. I'm not the center. But Paul says, listen, I suffer to preach the gospel. I want you to think about that. See, I'm all for short-term missions trips. I like it. Fantastic. Great stuff. But some of those are more like holidays than they are actually actually doing ministry. Because what happens, you think, oh, I get to go. Everyone else pays for me and I get to preach and teach and no responsibility. They go back home again. They don't carry the burden of it. I'll tell you what will happen if people go out and do that and then you suffer out there and you still want to go back, that'll speak volumes. Does that make sense? See, Paul's saying, listen, I'm not a child anymore. I've suffered for the gospel. I'm fulfilling the word of God in my life, not for me, but for you. See, when you minister and you really learn about what it means to minister and to serve, that's what ministry is. It means serving. You're doing it not for your benefit, but for the benefit of those that you're speaking to, the benefit that you're coming alongside. You're giving out of yourself. You're being poured out as a drink offering on the altar of other people's faith. Now you're growing up now. Your victories in Jesus and the union with him, your, your communication and, your, and, and the obedience. The goal of the power of the spirit is for you to walk in obedience, not just so you can do miracles. Yeah. Yeah. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you so you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's the great commission being fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But the Holy Spirit's power is not just so that I can pray for the sick. I wanna pray for the sick and I want them to get healed. I like to see the dead raised. I like to see the, the miraculous take place. Hallelujah, God does it. 
people getting delivered of demons. Wonderful. But do you know that the word he says to be witnesses this is the word martoretto. It means one who dies, lays down their life for what they believe. We get our word martyr from it. He said, the power of the spirit is given to you so that you can walk with Jesus. He said, if you want to come after me, you have to be able to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He says, if you really want to come out, so it's not about me anymore. Paul says it this way. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I live by faith in, in, in the son of God. It's not by his own merit, not by his own work, not by his own effort. He works in me mightily, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And so this working this out, the power of the spirit, that, that enabling from God is so that, because we don't naturally want to lay down our lives. Who knows that? I mean, find it difficult sometimes. Some of you are like, I'm not raising my hand. I'm going to get caught. All right, well. So, you know, like if someone cuts in front of you in the queue, you're like, yeah. die to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my rights. Great. Why don't you, they're pinned there now. Why don't you tell them about Jesus? See, what happens is, is the power of the Spirit he gives us so that I can say no to me and he helps me to say yes to Jesus and I grow up. And the process of that, that's the firing bin. That's the place where the fires are. And we go through it and the only thing that get burnt up is the bondages, the mess up stuff, the, the impurities so that I can come out as gold. I, this is just straight teaching this morning. I understand that. So in, in New Hope, let me finish. I'm just going to come into land now. See, the fullness is in Christ. The fullness is in Christ. So not only your victory, not only your intimacy with him, your uh, salvation is, but the fullness is in only in Jesus. Now, how many of you guys want to grow up in your faith? Okay, I'm not looking, so I, this is before God. So, All right, so let me, let me just give you uh, five things really fast, just real quick so you got to pay attention. Okay, the first one is intimacy, your personal life with Jesus. You need to be in the word, you need to be in prayer, and you need to spend that time with him. Well, I just do it while I'm driving. No, 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 no. If you did that with your wife, she'd smack you. The only time you talk to her was when you're in your van or in your truck or doing that kind of, no, 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 no. He wants a face-to-face. -face. So spend time, okay? That's intimacy. So you're gonna go and spend time with Jesus. Secondly, um, when we gather, do you know that one of the first one of the first goals of God in regards to your salvation is you're a worshiper. In fact, John chapter four, Jesus said, the father seeks worshipers who worship him in spirit and truth. So um, if you're online today, watching at home, you should be here. You need to gather and worship. Say, yeah, but I was busy. Put what you're doing down and do what he wants you to do. You need to gather and worship. Why? Jesus said, two or three gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So there's a blessing and something that goes on when you're gathered with the saints, when you're gathered together, there's something that happens in the community of God's people that doesn't happen when you're just on your own. You need to gather. This is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So we gather together, we sing. It's probably one of the only times in the week that you'll gather with someone else to sing with all your heart. And you say, well, I can, I can do without it for one week. Intimacy with God, worship. When you come and worship, you're in a place of receiving. I, I get to do the serving. I get to do the speaking. I get to do the serving to help you. Other people, when they're singing, when they're doing, people in kids zone, they're here to serve your family. They're here to give of themselves to help you. And we gather to receive. We gather to worship. Thirdly, we fellowship. You need fellowship. Fellowship is the reciprocal. You got something I need. I got something you need. Let's share it together. So we hang out in life groups. Yeah, there's other groups that you can gather where you pray together, you stand together, you talk together, you pray for one another, you're in the word together, you minister to one another. It's a reciprocal thing. If you're not doing that, you're not gonna grow as you ought to. Yeah. By the fellowship of our faith, we have a better understanding of all good things that we have in Christ. 
If you're not in a life group and you've already done a foundations group, you should be. If you've not done, if you've not done a foundations group, why not? You should be in it. You need to be grounded in your faith. You need to know why you believe what you believe and how do I walk into it in the best of my ability under God. He'll help you by his spirit. But the fellowship is absolutely necessary. So I can be, it's just me and Jesus. Uh Uh-uh. At the beginning, what did God say? In a perfect creation, he says, it's not good that man is alone. So no, I don't agree with you. It's just me and Jesus. It's us and Jesus. There's a community of God's people. Fourthly, there's a giving out. Do you know why the Dead Sea is dead? It only takes in. No outlet. Some of y'all are still in that framework, like the kids, like children. Me, 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 me. If you're going to grow up in Christ, then you have to learn how to serve other people. So you give yourself to do things for others. And there's no, listen, there's no kickback. There's, what I mean by is that there's like some people, I'll do something, maybe I'll do something nice for you because I know you'll do something nice for me. That isn't serving. That's self, selfish ambition. So when I come, I come just to give. If you give something back, that's up to you. But I, I come just give for give. That's what love does. And when you're functioning by the fullness of the spirit in love, you're going to produce that fruit of serving others without demanding something in return. What happens if they don't say thank you? What if they don't appreciate it? What, what, if, what if while I'm preaching, they're just sitting there going. <laughs> it happens. I had a lady after I preached once. Uh, she goes, I came here this morning to thank you for all that you were doing with my son who was in university. I came to visit today. And she goes, but after I heard what you said this morning, I want to punch you in the face. So I go, well, cheers. You sit there. I'll sit here. <laughs> There's some distance between me and you. We had to talk with her for a bit and then pray with her. She went home, wrote back a letter saying, thank you for what you did. It was like being born again, again, she said. But see, what if you get offended then? Well, how dare you? Get out of my church. Hmm. But you give, you give out. And number five, repeat. Repeat. Sorry, you want me to say that again, Liz? Re- that means do it again. So you do the intimacy bit. You do the fellowship bit. Pardon me, you do the worship bit. You do the fellowship bit. You give out a bit. And then go back to the beginning and do it over again. Yeah? If you will do that. If you will spend time with him, if you'll spend time in worship, you'll spend time with others that are in the faith. If you'll walk in that obedience and give out and you keep doing that, I guarantee you by the authority of God's word, you will grow up in your faith and you will continue to the end. And you'll see the manifestation of your faith and your hope when you see him face to face with great joy, without fear, in full assurance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love this morning. Thank you that you're the God who heals and you're the God who who delivers. You're the God who saves us. Salvation is of the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that there is a way forward. There is a way through. There is a way up. There's There's a hope that we have reserved for us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can press forward looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So I pray for these, your saints that are here this morning and even those watching online or maybe there are those going to watch later on at some point, Lord, and you're speaking to them right now. Lord, draw their hearts, get a hold of them. Help them to repent from mixture and from, Lord, trying to pretend. And Lord, may they come to you and know you for real. Open their eyes. Open the eyes of your people this morning. May your truth find good soil. May, Lord, repentance be that gift that we can change from the way we've done things to the way you want us to do things so that we can, Lord, that I can see every man presented perfect in Christ. They may be presented before you as a sacrifice, as an offering. Lord, you'll, you'll see the travail of your soul and you will be satisfied. So we just ask your grace upon us all the way across the board. And Lord, we just give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.